and welcome to this uh, first ever in-house mother house retreat, I think. And um, as you all know, Sister Diane needs no introduction, but I wanted to welcome her. And we know what a great scholar she is, what a great preacher she is, and I am sure that her insights on the book, Laudato Si, will have much to say to all of us. And I'm, I'm really grateful she said yes. We're lucky to have her here, and I think of her caliber, and I, I that line of, a prophet is never recognized in their own home. Well, I think today we recognize our own prophet, so please welcome Diane. Thank you. Let us sit down here. All right, good morning. Um, <clears throat> let me explain what I want to do uh, this week. I realize that this is a retreat and not a workshop. Um, however, the material that I'll be covering is new for all of us, whether we have been reading in this area or not. So there will be um, new insights um, that I hope I will be able to share with you. But the important thing is what you do with the insights that you get. Okay? My first question is, can you all hear me? All right, because I can always move this a little bit. All right. Uh, so that's number one. And, um, and secondly, I have no idea, you know, to what extent you have access to the document. I notice that many of you do have copies of it. Um, on the one hand, I would encourage you to read it, of course. And on the other hand, I'm really not going to talk about the document so much as some of the theological underpinnings of what the Holy Father says and then look at uh, biblical passages that we have misread. And our misreading of biblical passages, uh, and also the fact that the teaching of the church has changed. All right? And consequently, it's not a question of ignorance. It's a, a question of changing because of new insights. If our thinking does not change when we get new insights about anything, we'll never buy new telephones. Well, we, never, we would never have gotten a dishwasher. But our thinking changes because of new insights. We're not used to having our religious thinking change because it's the word of the Lord. Well, one thing about the Roman Catholic Church you can be sure of. One thing, it always changes. It may change slowly, but you and I do not understand our faith the way our grandparents did, the way they did in the Middle Ages, and certainly not the way the early Christians did. All right? So, we, we've, we have to realize that we must change our thinking. And it is never easy to do so. Never. Particularly when the way we understand things is not simply with telephones or washing machines, but it is the way we understand ourselves and our relationship with God. And that can be very, very intimidating if not frightening, to realize it's time to change that. God is not a super human being sitting up in, a, in, a, in the clouds on a chair, on a throne. And if there is anyone in this room who thinks that, my Jesus, mercy. I'd like to begin by reading again the prayer or the reading, I should say, that Janet did this morning at morning prayer. But I, that's the second paragraph in Laudato Si. Don't read it with me. 
listen. But I want to really read the first one, the first paragraph, first. Laudato si mi signore. Praise be to you, my Lord. In the words of this beautiful canticle, St. Francis of Assisi reminds us that our common home is like a sister with whom we share our life and a beautiful mother who opens her arms to embrace us. Beautiful poetry. Is it to be understood historically, literally, scientifically? It's metaphor. It's beautiful poetry. And when we are dealing with profound things in human life, we seldom use science. We seldom use philosophy. We always use poetry because poetry is much broader than science and philosophy, which is very exact, and that means it's limiting. So he uses metaphor. Praise be to you, my Lord, through our sister, Mother Earth. Isn't that interesting? Our sister, Mother Earth. Two metaphors to talk about Earth. Our sister as another creature, our mother as that from which we come forth. I used to think that Francis was really a strange little man, and I still think he probably was. But he did not use poetry simply as poetry. He used that because he recognized the connection you and I recognize the connection. We don't always reflect on the fact. We recognize a connection with trees. You and I know if there are no trees, we will not be able to breathe. Because trees transform carbon dioxide into oxygen so we can breathe. We know that but we don't reflect on it enough. You and I have an intimate relationship with kohlrabi <laughs> because it's made of the same stuff that we're made of. Otherwise, we couldn't eat it. But we don't think about that. Whether you like it or not, it's made of the same stuff. So there's an awful lot that we know intellectually but we're so busy with other things that we don't reflect on that intimate relationship. Now is our chance. Praise be to you, my Lord, through our sister Mother Earth, who sustains us and governs us. We don't think that. Oh, well, yeah? Of course we do. When the weather is not to our liking, we protect ourselves from the weather. Whether that be rain or snow or sunshine, it governs us and we don't change the weather. Ask the people who are experiencing disastrous weather right now who sustains and governs us and her, who produces various fruits with colored flowers and herbs. It's all poetry. And then we get to the second paragraph where the Holy Father points out to us what we have done to this beautiful world. This sister now cries out to us because of the harm that we have inflicted on her by our irresponsible use and abuse of the things with which God has endowed her. Why do we do that? Because we're monsters? I don't think so. Sometimes we do that because we have been ill-informed. We have learned, you and I have learned 
We have a right to do with it what we want. After all, it's ours. Years ago, remember that movie, The A-Team? There was a black man who was always just loaded down with gold jewelry, Mr. T. Whether you knew him or not, but he was a, a television star who bought an estate in River uh, Forest River, River Forest, River Forest outside of Chicago. And he, 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 just, he uh, tore down the house that was on it and cut down most of the trees because he wanted to build something else. The neighbors and environmentalists were up in arms with cutting down the trees. And he said, it's my property. I can do with it what I want. Cut down too many trees, we not only lose oxygen, we will then be putting ourselves in jeopardy to mudslides. All right, because Earth follows its own laws, not always ours. And we can see what happened. I mean, if you watch the news, what rain has done. Rain! What rain has done. What water flowing through the streets of the city sweeps away a house. We have come to see ourselves as her lords and masters, entitled to plunder her at will. Now, you may not cut down trees, but you and I waste food. You and I, we took a vow of poverty, waste water. We waste things. Well, we don't need them. They have no value. We throw them away. They have no value. Who says they have no value? The violence present in our hearts, wounded by sin, and not the first sin. I, I mean, it's what I have just described. Just a little aside, in 1990, Pope John Paul II, in his January 1st letter of peace, dedicated that letter to the concern of ecology. And he said, eco-justice is a moral issue, a moral issue. I once asked a friend, a, a male colleague of mine, a priest colleague of mine, when we were talking about this a while ago uh, at CTU in, in conversation and also in faculty seminar, have you ever had anyone come into the confessional and accuse, and accuse her or himself of using too much water? Whoever confesses echo sins. It's a moral issue. He said this in 1990. 31 years ago, we haven't gotten a message yet. Wounded by sin is also reflective in the symptoms of sickness evident in the soil. The soil is toxic. Remember the very first time it was at a New York suburb. I can't remember where. I don't know if it was Staten Island or what. But a whole housing development had to be moved, if you will remember, because the land on which the people were living was toxic. And how did they know? Because so many people from that housing development had developed cancer. So we have, we have made the, the soil toxic. We've got air that's toxic. It's not just the virus that floats around that we're, we are wearing masks for. There have been places in the United States where people have been wearing masks for years. Years ago, several years ago, I was in Taiwan. Taiwan was called Formosa in the past. Formosa means beautiful island. It's the first time I ever saw people on the main street on motor scooters almost universally wearing masks. The air was so polluted in Formosa. And of course, they were on motor scooters polluting the air. We're caught in this. We're caught in it. 
That's original sin. You don't get away from that. That's original sin. Not something that's a mythical man or woman committed in the, in the past. Sickness evident in the soil, in the water, in the air, and in all forms of life. He's very critical of how we have lived. This is why the earth herself, burdened and laid waste, is among the most abandoned and mis maltreated of the poor. She groans in travail. We have forgotten that we ourselves are dust of earth. Our very bodies are made up of her elements. We breathe her air and we receive life and refreshment from her waters. Now, that sounds like a very negative tone on which to begin a retreat. But it's a tone on which the document begins. I'd like to read something else, if I may. And you can't see no, because I have the microphone. <laughs> What is it about the universe so fascinates the human spirit? We turn to the sun during the day looking for warmth and reassurance and to the night sky in awe and wonder. We've always been challenged by its immensity. As children, didn't you go out and look at the sky? I remember as a teenager at night, used to go out and walk in our garden. We've been challenged by its immensity, captivated by its power, thrilled by its grandeur. Am I the only one in this room who ever ran after a butterfly? What, what is it about it? And where did we lose that wonder? Or did we? Maybe we didn't. Down through the centuries, many have believed that the mystery of their future is somehow hidden in the position of the stars. People today make a lot of money out of that. There's no wonder that the celestial bodies have frequently be thought, uh, been thought to be somehow divine. The way we understand the cosmos has always influenced many of our religious perceptions. The way we understand the cosmos has always been in influenced many of our religious perceptions. Evidence of this celestial influence can be traced throughout the history of scientific discovery. Pythagoras, Insistence that the earth is a sphere and not a flat challenge, uh, or not flat, challenged literal belief that God is enthroned in heavens above. I'm sure I'm not the only one who has sometimes seen at a basketball game somebody who makes a three-pointer and then looks up. And I'm thinking, of course, and what's he doing? <laughs> Not checking the rafters. We talk about going up to heaven. Now, that's a cosmological point of view. When the earth was flat, or we believed the earth was flat, and we believed that God was in the heavens, ascension made sense. He ascended into heaven. Assumption made sense. She was assumed into heaven. Now, we know that the earth is not flat. We know that the earth is a sphere. And if the earth is a sphere, which way is up? And how far is up? And if you know anything about cosmology, and most people know something about cosmology, unless Jesus and or Mary has hit something 
as they are shooting out into space. The further away they have gotten from gravity, the faster they're going, and they are still on a trajectory shooting out into space. Jesus first and Mary behind him because she was assumed much later. Now you know that's ridiculous. But there are people who interpret that part of our theology literally without knowing it's a metaphor and also without realizing how intricate our understanding of cosmology is to the way we understand God. When the cosmology changes, your understanding of God will change. Does that mean I don't believe that Jesus was ascended into heaven and Mary was assumed? Of course that doesn't mean that. Of course I believe that. I just don't believe it that way. Not even Paul talks about the ascension of Jesus, but he does say that Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. Why the right hand? The place of honor determined by someone in power who was right-handed. If that person had been left-handed, it would have been the left hand of God. But all of that is part of how we describe our theology, the way we understand cosmology and the way we understand life. And when we get new insights, then we should change our understanding. There's an awful lot in our prayers that may not be the best theology if you interpret it literally. But it's a metaphor. And we use metaphors all the time in common language. All the time. You know, we, we talk about people as being sweet. Mary Neff was a very good friend of mine. Mary Neff was a sweet woman. A genuinely sweet woman. Now, interpret that literally. How would I know that? The only way I would know that is if I have taken a bite out of her. But we talk about people as being sweet. We, we say, you know, I laughed so hard I thought I'd die. Really? I, I point this out because we always talk in metaphor, but we understand what our metaphors mean. So we don't have to interpret them. One of the difficult things in learning another culture is figuring out their metaphors and their humor. Because humor is always a play on words. Because people understand it differently. But, you know, when we come to our theology, whether it be systematic theology or biblical theology, which is really metaphoric, not philosophical, metaphoric, um, we interpret it literally. Why do we do that? Because we're dummies? No. Because that's what we were taught. And that's the way we understood it in the past. But someplace along the line, we stopped reinterpreting or we stopped learning that it's been reinterpreted. That, by the way, is exactly what preaching is supposed to be all about. Taking something and making it meaningful in a new context. So we go back to this thing about cosmology. Copernicus, with his heliocentric model of the universe, that the sun does not go around the earth, but the earth goes around the sun, um, he threatened well-established concepts of divine determined, I'm sorry, of divinely determined human dominance in the universe. Human dominance in the universe. Human dominance on life in this world, on this earth. That is the heart of the ecological disaster. That's it, right there. Not our misuse of the, of the natural, of natural world. The, our misuse of the elements of the natural world come out of our sense. God created the world and gave it to us to use as we see fit. 
We learned that someplace. And we know now that's wrong. We know that's wrong just as we know that God is not a man. We learned that from feminist, a new feminist insight. Think of all the insights and how our life and our understanding and our use of theology has changed with the feminist, new feminist insight. What we're being asked by theologians and by scientists is now look at reality, not simply through the lens of feminism, but through the lens of integrity of creation. Same process, harder job, harder task. Darwin's insight into evolutionary processes disputes the notion of the direct creation of humankind. And that is still a controversial issue. Time-honored religious understandings of how God works and of the place of human beings in creation. Over time, many of these theological understandings have been corrected and reinterpreted. However, correction or reinterpretation does not come easily. We are now at another point in history where our entire understanding of what it means to be human, that means anthropology. Our entire anthropology must be reinterpreted from the perspective of, a perspective of integrity of creation. Now, why do I say that? Well, because science says that, and so does the Holy Father. Back in 1967, there was a, a philosopher of science teaching at Sanford University in California. His name was Lynn White. And he wrote an article in the magazine Science. And the title of the article is The Historical Roots of Our Ecologic Crisis, 1967. What were you thinking in 1967? I know I was not thinking of ecology in 1967. That didn't happen until maybe in the early 80s, which means I was 20 years behind him. And, you know, look at 67. He made a couple of claims when he said he lays it at the footstep of the Judeo-Christian tradition, which means the Bible. All right? And he said this, one thing that ancient Israel did was uh, move away or present a monotheism. Now, monotheism is a good insight, but please realize that with monotheism, everything is limited to one point of view. And what, it hap what happened at the, um, in the ancient world when Israel came to the new monotheistic point of view, they desacralized the natural world. Now, what do I mean by that? I'm sure you, you, know, you are all aware that many countries, many societies, and civilizations in the ancient world thought that the powers of nature were divine. So the sun was a god. The sun was not a creature of God. The sun was a god. The moon was a god. All right? The trees were gods. The, the springs were gods. They saw gods in the plural. They recognized the magnificent powers of nature. That's a wonderful insight. But they credited that those insights and those powers, I should say powers, not insights, as being divine themselves. And what ancient Israel did is what say they are not gods. And that's a magnificent insight. They are not gods. They may be creatures of God. They come from God, but they're not gods. So they, that religion desacralized the natural world. And gradually, that desacralization resulted in disdain. That people no longer not only 
looked at nature as divine, but they didn't even value nature. And evidence of that is what happened with the um, Industrial Revolution. Now, all of this took hundreds of years, but you and I are the beneficiaries of both the advances and the error in thinking of those that have gone before us. This is what Lynn White says. What we do about ecology depends on our ideas of human relationship. More science and more technology are not going to get us out of the present ecological crisis. More science is not going to help solve this issue, nor is more technology until we find a new religion because our understanding is grounded in certain religious concepts. Now I should have put a comma after that word until we find a new religion, comma, or rethink the old one. And that's what we do. Now that's Lynn White in 1967. And this is Pope Francis in 2015. This is paragraph 111. Ecological culture cannot be reduced to a series of urgent but partial responses to the immediate problems of pollution, environmental decay, and the depletion of natural resources. What he's saying is it is not enough to address the consequences. There needs to be a distinctive way of looking at things, a way of thinking, policies, an educational program, a lifestyle, and a spirituality, which together generate resistance to the assault of the technocratic paradigm. And by techno technocratic paradigm, he's talking about the mentality, just give us enough time and money and we'll solve the problem. It is very important that we recycle. But I once heard somebody say, that's kindergarten. Recycling is kindergarten unless you change the way you understand yourself as a human being. And fundamentally, those of us who are part of the Judeo-Christian tradition understand ourselves as a human being, as made in the image and likeness of God. And I want to suggest we may not know well what that means. We may not know well what that means. To say that we are made of body and soul is a dualistic understanding of being a human being. We are a unity. But we still talk about the separation of the soul from the body. We still use that language. And I don't know to what extent you know we believe that there is that separation, but that is a dualistic understanding. We are not two pieces. We are not animals with spirit. And we are not spirits with bodies. We are human beings. Nor are we Martians. We are earthlings, which is a beautiful way of saying we are mud people. We're mud people. And that's not an insult. We are made of earth. We are what Earth produces. That's not bad. Look what Earth has produced. Earth has produced bees. Earth has produced mud people who write poetry. 
Earth has produced mud people who can sing praises to God and know that they're doing that. I don't know who coined the expression. I once thought it was um, Julian Huxley. We human beings are the natural world reflecting on itself. But the language we use makes it sound like we are separated from the natural world. You know, we have a relationship with nature. That's odd, that expression. We have a relation. That's like saying, I have a relationship with my hand. I don't, I don't talk about a relationship with my hand or with my gallbladder. That's me. Now, different parts of me, yeah, but it's me. You and I are the natural world. We are earth that got up and walked around and started building buildings, but then so did the beaver. So we do other things that the beaver doesn't do. So what, what, what I think we have to begin with when we talk about you know, our responsibilities, we've got to begin by realizing, on the one hand, we are not as good as we think we are. And on the other hand, we're a lot better than we think we are. And both are true. We are not, contrary to Leonardo DiCaprio, who stood and, at the, pop, the bow of the Titanic and said, I am the master of the universe. Or some such, you know, even though we sometimes act like it, we're not. I mean, who do we think we are? We think the natural world should revolve around us. And don't say you don't, because we do and don't even realize it. Years ago, in Chicago, there was a cold winter. 76 degrees below zero wind shield factor. That is a cold winter. And the news reported that a man came out and his car wouldn't start. What did he expect? <laughs> So he went inside, he got his revolver, he came out, and he shot the radiator twice. Now you can laugh and think, that's ridiculous. But what was he saying? The natural world should not frustrate my plans. That's what he was saying. The same thing we say when we are standing on a corner waiting for a bus in a snowstorm, and the traffic does not allow the bus to come on time, and we miss our appointment. Or better yet, we're at the airport, and the plane is delayed, and we're not going to make our connections. I cannot believe that there is anyone who can hear my voice who has not been frustrated by those kind of situations. What do we think we are? Listen, I got a 10.30 meeting. Stop the snow. Stop it. I, I mean, that's what we're th presuming. Now, I, again, I exaggerate, but think about how frustrated you become when the weather is not of your liking. By the way, what is bad weather? What is bad weather? I suggest bad weather is weather that inconveniences us. You can't say that rain is bad weather because farmers want rain. Now, rain like a deluge, like they're suffering on the East Coast, we might call that bad weather. But bad is not a good word to use. It is the consequence of the laws of nature. And how can that be bad? But of course, what we're saying, it either inconveniences us because we miss our appointment, or there is serious inconvenience. It destroys our lives. 
Weather is indifferent to us. We all know that. Or am I the only one who is disappointed sometimes when my plans are frustrated or thwarted? I can't believe that I'm that different. But we might do different things. But where does that come from, that we think weather should accommodate us rather than we should accommodate weather? And that's just one thing, just one thing. Uh, uh, whether that be you know, the, the natural world in terms of weather, the natural world in terms of producing the fruits of the earth. One last, one last thing that I want to point out. There are three words, very important words, that the Holy Father uses constantly in Laudato Si. One of them is anthropocentrism. Anthropocentrism, which, which is akin to egocentrism. Egocentrism, of course, you know that we are egocentric. The world revolves around me. Anthropocentrism, it's not me, it's us, human beings. Anthropos comes from the Greek word human. So it's human-centered. He never uses that word without the negative adjective. Because in a certain sense, there is no way we can be but anthropocentric. We, contrary to what some movies may say, you're, you know, the horse whisperer really does not know what the horse is thinking or feeling. Maybe very sensitive to some movements, but all we know is what human beings think and feel and dream about. And we judge everything else from our own human point of view. That's the only way we can do it. But realize that's a limitation. To presume that if there are Martians, we're going to understand them. I was reading something just yesterday. Perhaps the only way we will ever be able to communicate with Martians is through math. Through math. Get ready. Because math is a universal. But universal within the realm of humanity or within the realm of Earth. But remember, Mars is part of our solar system. Same Big Bang, made of the same stuff, unless something from another solar system has crashed in. But he uses, the Holy Father does, a negative adjective, distorted anthropocentrism, inadequate anthropocentrism, radical anthropocentrism. What does that mean? It means that it's one thing to say we can only understand from a human point of view. It's another thing to say we judge the value of everything else from a human point of view. Now, I want to tell you, I personally am not crazy about mosquitoes, but they have a place in the web of life. What it is, I don't know. But that's not the mosquito's problem, that's mine. So there are things I don't particularly like. There are things that we don't particularly like. But because we don't like them and they inconvenience us, does not mean they have no value. Because if that's what it means, we are saying God creates things that have no value. And I don't believe that, and neither do you. But radical anthropocentrism means if I don't need it, it has no value. How many times have we thrown stuff away thinking it has no value anymore? And then understand, you know, discover maybe it did. So that's one word, anthropocentrism. And where does that come from? An interpretation of uh, image and likeness, which we'll, I'll discuss um, at another time. The next one is interconnectedness, which I've talked about. We are made of the same stuff of the rest of creation. We are interconnected. We are interconnected. We can, we can use stuff of Earth and of each other to improve my life. Uh, we, we can let, live off of each other's blood. We can live off of each other's organs. 
We can walk on titanium. There was something on television yesterday of a man who was a champion, uh, I don't know, an archer. He has no hands, he has no arms. He does it with his feet. All right? Um, but we can live off of, you know, uh, titanium, or we can walk. Some people can walk and run on titanium. So there's an interconnectedness. The Holy Father talks about that. And the last one is interdependence. That's the last important word. But that's a very interesting word. Because you and I are totally dependent for life, totally dependent on elements of the natural world. And to this date, we have discovered nothing in the natural world that is dependent on us. Nothing. In fact, there are deep ecologists that say the worst thing that has happened to the natural world is the appearance of human beings. I don't subscribe to that. But I understand why they say that. And we've all seen evidence of that at the beginning of the pandemic, when the canals in Venice, the water was clean. And they could see the fish in the canals in Venice. You can't do that when there are people around. And believe it or not, Los Angeles had some of the cleanest air in the United States because nobody was out on the roads. So the natural world is not dependent on us. We are dependent on the natural world. Now that sounds like a harsh statement, but it's not. It is our challenge. It is our challenge. You know, the, the Chinese always say, pray God that you never live at a time of crisis. Not because it's hard, but because you become responsible. At a time of crisis, we become responsible for making decisions, not just to get us out of our crisis. Crisis means that something new is possible, and we become responsible. So we become responsible, you and I. We don't outgrow that. We're not too old. You know. We don't retire from that responsibility. But it's not just a responsibility. It is a privilege. Talk about leaving a mark. Leaving a mark in our generation. That we will learn to clean up our world. We will learn to live interdependently. We will learn to recognize and appreciate our interconnectedness. We will be green people, not like little Martians, but green people meaning people who are eco-sensitive. That we will recognize, you know, in a certain sense, that we have been given so much, given so much, First of all, the opportunity of life that Earth has produced, not just our parents, but we come from, we are of Earth. And we owe so much to Earth. I was told one time by somebody who belongs to a religious community in Hawaii. I forget the name of the community, but it's the one that Damien the leopard belonged to. Uh, I think it's, you know, it's either it's this, this uh, holy names of Jesus and Mary or something. It's, it's got two things in there. I can't remember what it was. However, they told the story of, of a young, uh, it was a, a woman, young novice, who part her for morning prayer always, she was native, but part of her morning, morning prayer always that she learned as a child at home was to stand in front of the ocean and thank the ocean for bringing her forth. I thought, that's a beautiful prayer. Now, some would say it's pagan. Thank God through the ocean. Well, who do you suppose she was praying to? 
It, that, I mean, God acts, but God acts through the ocean. And was grateful for that. For what in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, are you grateful? Where's the interconnectedness? Not just among the people, but for Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, for 330 County Road K. Now, I'm not suggesting that you go out and embrace a tree. But why not? At least in your mind and in your heart, because those trees help to make us healthy. It, it, they nourish our bodies, they nourish our spirits. And, and the warmth of the sun, which we cannot live without. And what do we do when it's warm? We complain. Now, it's not fair for me to say that because I love the heat. So I'm not, I mean, it sounds like I'm finding fault on anybody who complains about the heat. You know, because the heat affects different people in different ways. But if it affects you in a way that's negative and all you do is sweat, isn't it wonderful that your body knows how to cool you off? I mean, are we aware? When was the last time we thought about all of the things in the natural world that we take advantage of? Or we just take for granted. And if we don't appreciate how dependent we are on it, we will never really appreciate what it means to be, in the best sense of the term, green. People of Earth who know where we come from, know where we're going, and in the in-between, know how to negotiate the kind of existence that a very mysterious power that we call God has given us the opportunity to do this. So while we have to look at mistakes, if you will, let's look at them not so much as sins, unless we, we know we shouldn't be doing this and we do it and, you know, regardless. We know we shouldn't be wasting things, but we waste regardless. And I want to tell you, in terms of water, I don't know how much water to use. I don't have any answers. Every one of us has got to negotiate how much of the natural world do I really need to live a productive life. I don't know how to do it in my own life, but I'm suggesting that's something we have to all learn to negotiate. At this point in life, all of us, or at least most of us, are dependent on chemicals, which are also made from stuff of earth. And again, you may not want to hug your medicine bottle, but again, think of how dependent we are. And not just on the doctor, but how dependent we are, how earth supports us, how stuff of earth supports us and challenges us. And when was the last time, or the first time, you said thank you? <laughs>